demons have all the marks of personality. Everything that you would associate with a person, a demon has. They are persons, persons without body, but just real persons. The majority of Christians caught up in this warfare with demons do not realize that they are dealing with persons, active, intelligent beings who study you and know you and know your weak points and your weak moments and just how to get advantage over you. And they act with intelligence. They have two main objectives assigned to them by Satan. The first one is to keep you from becoming a Christian, from knowing Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what means they use as long as they achieve that objective. Their second main objective if they fail in the first, is to keep you from being an effective Christian. They have not kept most of you from Jesus Christ. They will now do everything they can to keep you from serving Jesus Christ effectively. They will plot and plan with supernatural intelligence to achieve this objective. And you are subject to their plotting and planning and attack. But you cannot escape. It's part of your environment as a Christian. In fact, it's part of the environment of the world. The world is people with unseen but very real agents who are called demons. There are three main phrases used in the New Testament to describe the activity and operations of demons in relation to a person. The first one is to be in an unclean spirit. The second one is to have an unclean spirit or an evil spirit. The third is a verb to be demonized. None of them justify the use of the word possess. This is a mistranslation. We are not talking about people who are possessed by Satan in the sense of being owned by Satan. Because if people are owned by Satan, they're not owned by the Lord. Christians are owned by the Lord. But in many Christians, I would say the majority of Christians, there are areas of their lives and personality which the Lord doesn't effectively control. And those are the areas where we have to look for demon presence and activity. They entice, they attract you to do that which is evil. They bring pressure upon you to do that which is evil. They enslave. When they've got you doing it, they make you their slaves. You're no longer a free agent. They torment. They are the tormentors of the New Testament. The New Testament speaks about the tormentors and they are the demons. They torment spiritually, mentally, physically. Uh, they torment mentally with the fear of insanity. This is one of their favorite forms of torment. They torment spiritually with a sense of guilt or unworthiness or rejection. They compel. They make you do things. Anything compulsive is probably demonic. Compulsive eating, compulsive drinking, compulsive talking, all these things. They defile, they make you feel unclean, they inject bad words and wrong thoughts and vile pictures and images into your mind. They harass, they follow you around, and as I said down here, they choose the weakest moment and the weakest place. Just when you want to relax is when they hit you. And seventh, very, very characteristic, and I'm glad I got it up. They deceive. They are the deceivers. They misrepresent things. They tempt you away from the truth and then inject error. The Bible speaks about the spirit of error, restlessness. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So your spirit, this total personality within you, is like a city. And if you haven't any control over there, you're like a city that's broken down without walls. Anything can get in at any time. And you have the greatest difficulty in getting it out. There are some people that the walls are totally broken down. They just have no more control over what comes in and out. Now, most of the people that Jesus dealt with were not in that category, as I pointed out yesterday. Most of them were religious Orthodox Jews who raised their families, tilled their fields, fished the seas, kept their stores, raised their children, and were outwardly normal citizens of Galilee or elsewhere. And yet, out of them, Jesus cast demons by the thousands. They were not maniacs. They were not criminals. 
Their cities were not totally broken down, but there were areas within where something demonic had found lodgment. Now that is the case with the majority of people that we deal with. They're not lunatics, they're not maniacs, they're not addicts in the sense of totally given over to heroin or something like that, just living for the one thing. But my experience is, I don't want to give a percentage, but the majority of people who come into the charismatic movement and are baptized in the Holy Spirit, somewhere inside them, they have areas where an enemy is in occupation. Uh, demons are very much like the mafia. And one of their principles is, as you know, that they operate in gangs. Well, the same is true with demons. They operate in gangs. And I have come to know them well enough that when I find pinpoint one member of a gang, I immediately start to look for the other members of that gang. And they're very rarely missing. They don't operate in, in, as individuals ultimately. Jesus said this when the unclean spirit had gone out of a man. He walks through dry places, finding rest, looking for rest, finds none. says, I've come back comes back, what? Not alone, but with seven other spirits, each more wicked than himself. He's brought his gang with him. See? And this is the way it regularly happens. In many people, there's been maybe a series of tremendous impacts on that emotional system through the years. Childhood. Well, I mean, I'll illustrate from my example. My root problem one of them, I won't tell you all of them, it <laughs> take too long, but I'll tell you one, is anger. And do you know what happened once, just to illustrate the subtlety of Satan? I was preaching in, a, in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and we'd got into deliverance. The woman came up to me and she looked at me and she said, you know, there's something in me that tells me things about people. And she said, when I walked into the meeting, it said to me, that man easily gets angry. <laughs> I said, thank you, Satan. See, she had a divining spirit. And her divining spirit was telling her my weak point. You don't know what you're in, believe me, friend, when you get into this. I said, you enjoy that type of power because it gives you a certain measure of power over people. And I said, as long as you enjoy it, you can stick with it. God won't deliver you from it. I had to speak very sharply to her to get her to repent. Then she was delivered. A spirit of divination came out. But remember that Jesus loves you, he's on your side, and whatever you have to confess to him, you'll never shock him, okay? But don't try to excuse everything you ever did and blame it on your aunt, your grandmother, your school teacher, or anybody else. Okay, now then, let's deal with these areas. The main one, I say, is emotions, attitudes, relationships. Now I'll take a few gangs and sketch them out for you. There's one that commonly affects young people in the United States today. There's three that come one after another. They are resentment, hatred, and rebellion. What happens is young people resent their parents, then they hate their parents, and then they rebel against their parents. And then they become rebels at large. You cannot ever have God's blessing on your life while your attitude towards your parents is wrong. Honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee. And if you do not honor your father and mother, it never will be well with you, though you live 80 years. You cannot have God's blessing on your life. That's one main cause of problems amongst thousands of people today. Another one that we'll take is, let's say, and there are many different little sort of areas, irritation, impatience, anger, after anger comes violence. And when you go to anger and violence, the next one is sure. You know what it is? Murder. The demon of murder does not come in because you have committed murder. It comes in to make you commit murder. You see that? That's like the demon of suicide does not come in because you have committed suicide, but to make you commit suicide. It'd be too late by the time you've committed. This is a very, very common order. Now, many people, when the demon of murder is cast out, and they get, oh, I'm horrified, but Brother Prince, I never committed murder. No, but if that demon had been allowed to have its way in your life, ultimately, that's what you'd have ended up doing. How many times when a murder is committed, does not the person who committed the murder say afterwards, I don't know what made me do it. Something took control of me and made me do it. They're not lying. 
They're not even excusing themselves. They're stating an objective fact. Now that murder demon might have been in that man 20 years before it succeeded in doing what it came there to do. I envisage a human life plotted by Satan this way. He plants his demons along the pathway of your life, starting in childhood and all the way along. And every time there's a weak place, he's got one there ready to jump in. And he's plotting to get you to hell. Let's take loneliness, common problem. Then you get self-pity, which is one of the commonest of all. And then you get misery. And then you get depression. And we're going on. Then you get despair. And after despair, suicide. That's right. Thoughts. The area of thoughts or the mind. Now, the main ones here that I'm aware of are doubt, unbelief, indecision, which is a common tormentor and confusion, which is one of the commonest in America today. Now, there are certain of these which are the almost inevitable consequence of getting involved in the occult. Going to a fortune teller, playing with the Ouija board, reading the horoscopes, there are certain which will almost always result. That one, Depression, confusion, and long enough carried on, suicide. And anybody that comes with severe depression and confusion and pressure to suicide almost certainly has been involved in the occult. They may not remember it. Their mother may have taken them to a fortune teller as a joke when they were five years old. But it's there. I would say to those of you that minister, if you find depression, confusion, and suicide, you can be almost sure that there's been involvement in the occult. And you will not find a permanent solution, lasting, complete deliverance, until that occult involvement has been confessed, renounced, and broken. All right, the next area is the tongue. And the main ones here are lying, blasphemy, unclean talk, and gossip, the churchy one. Okay, uh, the particularly remarkable one is lying. The Bible speaks about a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab, and incidentally that was because he was involved in the occult through his, husband, through his wife Jezebel. There are, as you're probably aware, compulsive liars. Uh, they really do not know when they're lying. In fact, they tell me a psychotic liar doesn't even phase the lie detector. He can pass the lie detector because he's not aware that it's a lie. It's rather interesting. The next one we're going to deal with when the board is clear is that nasty thing nobody ever talks about in church, sex. As far as the church is concerned, we're sexless beings. Isn't that right? We... <laughs> The moment you walk into church, you lose your sexuality, and you sit there a non-sex being till you walk out again. And then <laughs> all those problems you politely shelved in the foyer return. And everybody knows when you're saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're not allowed any sex problem. Well, everybody used to know it. In my experience amongst Pentecostals, it just, you just didn't admit to these problems. Now, I have to say three things about sex while he's cleaning the board. Number one, basically, sex is not evil, it is good. Did you get that? God created the human race, male and female. And at the end, everything he had created was very good, including their sex. The sex is not evil. Secondly, it is no sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Thirdly, if you are tempted and fall, it does not mean you need to get rid of a demon. All you need to do is repent, confess, go to Jesus, receive his forgiveness and the cleansing of his blood. You are justified, just as if I'd never sinned. But if when you've done that, you're still enslaved, and no matter how much you hate it, and how much you struggle, and how much you wet your pillow at night with tears, and the sense of shame you may feel, you still cannot stop. That thing has an awful fascination of power over you. Then you need deliverance from a demon. Now, in this area of sex, there are certain common demons. 
The commonest, which isn't nice to write on the board, but I will, is masturbation. Now I realize it's normal for many people to be tempted along that line. And as I've said, being tempted is not a sin. Yielding does not mean necessarily that you are possessed. But when it becomes enslaving, compulsive, then it is demonic. And it can be a very powerful demon. I think of a woman, my wife will recall, in Chicago, who was everything. I mean, you name it, she was it. She was a prostitute, she was a lesbian, she was a dope addict, she was everything. And God miraculously saved her in a brothel. And, I mean, saved her life, because normally to leave the brothel, she would have been bumped off. And she came to us and progressively got deliverance from heroin, nicotine, all these horrible things. The last thing she got delivered from was masturbation. And that was the hardest of all. It was more powerful than any of those other demons. And it took two hours to get that one demon out. And I don't believe we were wasting our time, because she was deadly in earnest. She lay there on the floor saying, don't leave me, it hasn't gone, it hasn't gone, it hasn't gone. And actually getting it out of her, if I may say so, was like squeezing it out of her body. You had to squeeze it out inch by inch by inch. Today, when I last heard of her, she's a pure woman leading a clean, victorious Christian life. But I had a, such a demonstration of the power of this particular thing. Now, marriage does not get rid of demons. Did you know that? Shall I tell you something else about marriage, if you're unmarried, that you may not realize? It doesn't change character. If a person has got a crooked, mean character before he gets married, he'll have a crooked, mean character after he gets married. Don't have any rose-tinted spectacles about the man or the woman you're going to marry. They'll have the same character after marriage as they had before. If they were unclean, dishonest, untidy, irresponsible with money before they're married, that's exactly the way they'll be after marriage. And it's very questionable whether you'll be able to change them. I have actually cast this spirit out of married men in their 50s and 60s. And I've dealt with multitudes of married people who have that problem. Now, I've got to be careful what I say, but I believe in being frank. This particular demon can, in some measure, spoil the marriage relationship in the sense that the person who has it will never be able to offer full satisfaction to their partner. Now, this is as far as I can go, but you understand what I mean. Demons are thieves, thieves, you see that? They'll slip in and steal what belongs to a child of God. I believe every woman has a right, every man has a right to the satisfaction of marriage. But many of the times the demon will slip, slip in and steal that satisfaction. I've dealt with women who said, my husband has never been able to satisfy. No, because he's a masturbator, to say it frankly. I mean, I'm getting very crude now, but that's, that's the way it is. And I have known marriage relations changed by deliverance from this spirit. All right, let's go on. Every form of homosexuality, in my opinion, is demonic. And the most homosexuals do not get delivered till they acknowledge that it's a demon. You can call it by any polite name you like, justify it by 50 different psychological versions of the facts, but you don't get delivered from psychological versions. You get delivered from demons. Another name which occurs here is perversion. Now, in the Hebrew, perversion is the same word as confusion. And in the 19th chapter of Isaiah, you'll find that the Lord said he would mingle a spirit of confusion in the rulers of Egypt. The same word is perversion. See, perversion is confusion of the sexes in the sex realm. It's when the man takes the female part or the female takes the male part. That's perversion. And again, I'm going to ask you to be indulgent, be frank. There are ways that married people practice sex which are perverse. And um, many times a wife comes to me and says, do I have to submit? My answer is no. Yes, I know the Bible says submit to your husband, but it doesn't say submit to the devil in your husband. Does it? You can go overboard on submission like anything else. I also don't believe that a wife is obligated to go on living with a practicing homosexual husband. That's why Jesus said marriage is permissible on the grounds of fornication. He didn't say adultery. Because adultery is only unfaithfulness in a marriage, but fornication includes homosexuality in the Greek. I just mentioned these things because all these problems come up. 
Now, one of the, the, the great problems of modern America is homosexuality. There are multitudes of homosexuals in our churches, multitudes of them, in every denomination. And much modern preaching leads them to suppose that this is a harmless aberration which they'll have to learn to live with. Now, Jesus didn't treat it that way. If you think about it that way, that's what you have to do, live with it. But you read the first chapter of Romans sometimes and see what God has got to say about that. Number five, where are we? Addictions. An addiction is a perverted appetite. That's basically what it is. I think all appetites basically are placed there by God for our good, but Satan causes us to pervert them, misdirect them, and then we become enslaved by them. Now, there are many common forms of addiction, but you know Brother Prince well enough. The first one he always puts up is gluttony. And that's the commonest in America, in my opinion. You see, it's a respectable addiction. Most churches, it's not respectable to be an alcoholic, but it's quite respectable to be a foodaholic. Now, that whether you become a foodaholic or an alcoholic depends only on your social situation. Let me point this out about addictions. An addiction is a branch on a trunk. In my opinion, addiction never is the beginning. There's always some frustration out of which the addiction emerges. You see, the frustrated Episcopalian wife takes to alcohol. But what's the drover to alcohol? The misbehavior of her husband. The frustrated Church of God wife takes the cookie jar and the pastry tray. What drove her there? The ice cream, don't forget that. What drove her there? Same thing. So when you deal with an addiction, you can do this. You can cut the branch off, but you still leave the trunk standing. See? Whereas if you cut the trunk down, the branch has to go. In other words, find out what's behind the addiction. Sometimes it's resentment. Sometimes it's rebellion. Sometimes it's fear. There are many different causes. Shame, guilt. There's gluttony, alcohol, nicotine, pep tablets, sleeping pills, caffeine, heroin, airplane glue, nail varnish, and scores of other strange things. The devil doesn't care how strange or improbable the thing is that he hooks you with. As long as he hooks you, that's all he's concerned. Any hook that will catch you is good enough for the devil. Now, I hope you're not thinking I'm preaching do not. But my experience with nicotine is that it's often more powerful than heroin. And I've heard David Wilkerson, not directly, but secondhand, say that he will not minister to an addict for deliverance if that addict will not give up smoking. And I agree. Because nicotine is a, is, a, is a kind of fifth column. It stays there and opens the door for the others to come back. And I have met not a few addicts. I know them personally who said it was more difficult to be delivered from nicotine than heroin. And of course, there's all sorts of other fancy things like marijuana and so on. But I have never found this wrong. If a person, when they get delivered, their fingers go stiff and begin to bend backwards. And if particularly also they get kind of cold or numb around the mouth, it's masturbation. I've never found it otherwise. And it just solves a lot of problems. You can tell that poor embarrassed person, I know what your problem is, just renounce it, it will go. That's one of the little, you can call it tricks of the train. You know the medical name for what I was describing in connection with masturbation is tetany. Now then, let's take the field of religion. Departures from the Christian faith. Heresies are departures from the Christian faith. That this is going to happen, let's just look at one scripture, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. It's the demons who speak lies, it's the demons who have their consciences seared with the hot iron. I can't take time to show it to you, but the Greek makes that absolutely clear. So in the latter times, some are going to depart from the faith. What is the faith? Christianity. 
So these people have known Christianity, are going to depart from it. You cannot depart from this building if you've never been in it, can you? And why are they going to depart? They're going to do it under the influence of demons, seducing spirits. And there are many, many, many seducing spirits. Religious spirits, spirits of error, spirits that entice you away from faith in Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. I tell you, error abounds on every side. There are seducing spirits of error that will deceive, if it were possible, the very elect. Now, you do not need to be deceived. You do not need to be deceived, but you do need to be on your guard. Now, I'll come back to heresies tomorrow. I don't know when we're going to get into deliverance, but I feel... Well, I'll take five more minutes now. <clears throat> I mean, if I could do it and I had more time, I would. But I want to give you the essence of heresy. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. This is the essence of heresy and we can't deal with it in all its ramifications. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Notice, talking to Christians, there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Now, I am on my guard against anything that's done in a sneaky, underhand way. The word privily. See, I'll tell you about the ministry of deliverance. I am not always popular for doing it in public. But that is my safeguard. All my mistakes are made in public. I don't do anything in secret that I don't do in public. I'll operate in a fishbowl and I like it that way. I don't believe in this higher revelation, this little super spiritual club, this little group that have got it. I will not go near them. Because anything that's privy, sneaky, underhand is satanic. If it can't be said in public, it shouldn't be said at all in most cases. All right. They shall privily bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them. That's the essence of damnable heresy. And it's doing two things. Denying the Lord and his redemptive work. The fact that he bought them with his blood on the cross. Now all heresy that's damnable, that costs you your soul if you continue in it, is stamped with that mark. It's a denial of the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross. Actually, the, the main enemy of all demons is Jesus. Now, I want to tell you this, that if you believe or entertain anything that touches or takes away from or dishonors the person, the nature, or the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are under the influence of a seducing spirit. And I'll tell you what I believe about Jesus. And you go down the list and check it. First of all, I believe that Jesus is God. He's divine. He's the Son of God. The only begotten of the Father. I believe that he was born of a virgin. And this is central. Because if he was not born of a virgin, he was a bastard. There's no other alternative. You've just got two choices. You can make one or the other. There's no third possibility. Furthermore, if he was not born of the virgin, then he was not the Messiah, because the Messiah was to be born of the virgin. The denial that Jesus is the Messiah is the spirit of Antichrist. That's the spirit that's behind that denial. I believe he led a sinless life. I believe he died an atoning death. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose physically from the dead. I believe he ascended physically into heaven, and I believe he's coming again physically like he was seen to go. Now, if you have any trouble about any of those propositions, you better examine your spiritual standing, because that is the mark of a damnable heresy. It's to deny the Lord Jesus and his redemptive work on the cross.